Hello and welcome to the Cuyamunga Institute in our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Education and Outreach, we want to thank you for joining us. If you're visiting us for the first time, let me briefly tell you about the Cuyamunga Institute and our mission. The Cuyamunga Institute is an independent, nonprofit anthropological research organization committed to expanding consciousness through the ancient practice of ecstatic transpostures. It was the insightful work of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman, who found the clues and revived the practice. She searched the oldest evidence available, which she discovered in the world's collection of prehistoric and indigenous art, and decoded these selected artifacts as ritual instructions. And as part of our mission is to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. Dr. Goodman provided a roadmap of how someone with an academic approach can delve deep into the world of direct experience. As an educational institution, we recognize that to thrive, we must take an open approach. So we invite scholars of parallel research and related fields that help broaden the scope of our work and exploration. Before we introduce our guest, we want to share an exciting discovery that was in the news this week, one which leads nicely into today's topic. In a cave in France, a discovery of an ancient musical instrument, estimated eight to 18,000 years old. So let me pull up a few pictures and share that with you. So some 18,000 years ago, in a cave in the part of the world what we now call France, a human being left something behind that was pretty intriguing, a conch shell. So this shell was discovered in a French cave almost 80 years ago and has been revealed to be the earliest known conch shell trumpet. Pretty extraordinary find at the Masula Cave in the foothills of the French Pyrenees. They discovered in 1931, it took all this time for researchers to re-examine it. It was during a recent inventory and question its purpose. Once thought to be a ceremony, ceremonial drinking vessel, they now thought maybe this is an instrument because we see conch shell instruments all over the world. So to confirm that this is a conch, what they did is they brought in a professional musician to help play the instrument, and they managed to produce three sounds close to the notes of C, C sharp, and D. And you'll play that for us in a moment. Yeah, I'll play the sound for you. So you can hear it. But interestingly, the musician complained about the jagged edge of the top where the tip of the shell had been knocked off the jagged edge hurt his lips. So he played those three notes and then quit. It was so painful. And that's where the researchers took a closer look at that, at that hole in the top. And they found that there was wax and resin, uh, an adhesive. So now they thought that perhaps this once held a pipe and they found further holes in like the a, inner chambers where the pipe would have been slotted down. A mouthpiece. A mouthpiece. They also found that the outer edge of the shell had also been chipped off, chipped away to make a smoother edge so that it would be easier to hold. And Paul, tell us about the red ochre finger marks. I will, but I also want to point out uh, the slide that's on the screen. Uh, numbers six, seven, and nine are other examples of conchs from around the world that have applied mouthpieces to the conch. And as you see, Laura mentioned that if you look at the image below, you see that there's red ochre marks, not only on the cave wall, but the ochre marks also are inside the conch itself. This brought an amazing amount of questions. Well, they found that the 18,000-year-old site where there was a bison etched on the wall, the cave wall, near where the conch was found, had the ochred, red ochre fingerprints imprinted to fill in the bison. Those same ochre fingerprints were found on the shell, both where it would be held and also in a decorative fashion. Thus, they could date it 
not from the shell itself, because they didn't want to take a piece of the shell out, but they carbon dated the charcoal from a fireplace right there at the site, and it came back as 18,000 years old. So that is an art panel, a reproduction of an art panel um, right there in that cave in Marsuna. And so it was Carol Fritz and Gila Tosello who are overseeing this research. This quote's pretty interesting. So he's saying, we are supposing that this shell was decorated with the same pattern as was used on the cave art, which established a strong link between the music played and the images on the walls. That, to our knowledge, is the first time that we can see such a relationship between music and cave art in European prehistory. That's so exciting. This is a map showing you the location in France where this exists. And of course, bird bone flutes have been found, and perhaps they think a bird bone was used as this mouthpiece that was attached to this particular conch shell. Even within our own work, we like to use gourd rattles, other types of instruments, but they don't last through time like a shell would or a bone would. So that's why we have so fortunate to find this. The leather skins, the gourds, um, the drum frames, anything wood that would have disintegrated long, long ago. Let me share with you some of the sound that came from this instrument. That's the very first recording of the instrument. Let's play that again. You know, there's only so many notes that you can get out of a conch shell, as you well know, because you play one. It's very, very exciting to hear what our ancestors of 18,000 years ago heard from this instrument. Well, in fact, it was uh, many years ago when we were traveling in vacation in Hawaii that in the winter. I gave time, you your first conch shell. I got a conch shell. Yeah, actually, you and I had wonderful experiences of spending time as we'd go to the beach for sunset, and all of a sudden you'd hear this mesmerizing sound of, of, of conches being blown as the sun goes down each day. So a lot of people showed up at the beach to celebrate the sun going down every year. Well, evening. actually, what was interesting is that or I, sunrise or sunrise. And actually, uh, it was interesting as I was preparing for today to share the research on the uses of conch and ceremonial practices. I came across an article that looked interesting, clicked on it. It was my very own article that I had written several years ago. <laughs> so I had forgotten I even had written it. So it came in handy anyway. Uh, let me share the sound of the conch that we that we have that, we that have. you're going to play for us. Okay. So this is a full-on conch. I wanted to show you the details of it. I do not have a mouthpiece. Kind of wish that I did now that I've been researching it more. I think you could insert one if you wanted. I would need to, to make it a lot easier on my lips. So it might take me a couple blows to get the good tone, but let's do this. So we've, now we've officially begun today's session. <laughs> we called okay. in the sacred. Yeah, thank you. Boy, well, that does. That's a, that's a way to call the spirits for sure. Yeah. Catch my breath. And uh, you know, yeah. so that was so. fun. So now, uh, yeah. So And then you mentioned that there's, there's a relationship to Shakespeare, which I had no idea. But uh, Oh, he had trumpets. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, you know, I really think that theater goes far, so far back. And theater has been... Um, such a conveyor of information, of culture, of 
um, things to think about. And we have today, you know, Shakespeare took many of his plots from ancient legends and then he reworked them. And his women characters have much to say on the page and between the lines. Um, we've spent a couple of months celebrating the divine feminine. And if I can speak on behalf of all who've been relegated to the sidelines through history, um, our voice is the greatest gift that our culture can give us now. Give us back. It's a gift to us, to our future, to our survival, to our health, to our children. And I want to say that our member of our community, Ellie Nichols, is here to give voice to four of the best known female characters and plays of Shakespeare. And uh, she joins us from New York City. And she's here to really bring us from inauthentic voice to authentic voice, from division of the male and female to love and eros. Hi, Ellie, and welcome. Thank you. I will turn it over to you right now Thank to you. pick up this thread of an ancient need to display and play to how we can embody that today. Absolutely. Um... What a lovely introduction and hi to everybody zooming in. Um, the vibrations are in the room and that's really exciting. So thank you, Paul, for making that a reality. Uh, like Laura said, my name is Ellie and I'm interested in sharing my research um, around Shakespeare and around communication and gender. Uh, so today is a day of love. And I wanna talk about some things I've fallen in love with, namely Shakespeare and my research at NYU, which is where I'm currently a graduate student. Um, so my thesis revolves around women's voices in Shakespeare, but what makes a voice significant is also the ability to listen and to hear. Uh, and I think that's what turns the work from uh, an independent pursuit into a relational one. So I'm hoping to use language today like women and men or masculine and feminine. And what I'm driving at when I say these terms is the idea of divine masculine and divine feminine, which exists in all of us in a certain balance. And um, what my work today is playing with the idea of not to dismantle the gender binary, but rather to examine our cultural gender hierarchy and see what it would look like if we had gender equality, if, um, if we didn't privilege some qualities over other qualities. Uh, and I do this through looking at conversations in Shakespeare's plays. Um, we're gonna end with a discovery around Romeo and Juliet because Romeo proves to be one of the few male characters in Shakespeare who actually asks Juliet questions without already assuming he knows the answer. And that's kind of radical. And I think that's a part of love. So um, to dial it back a second, I, I'm going to share with the group what led me to Shakespeare in the first place. And, I've always been interested in theater and art and performance because I'm interested in the human experience and what it means to have a body. And this interest kind of like ebbed and flowed throughout my life, but eventually led me to do a six week intensive at Shakespeare and Company. And that's where I started to see the overlap between the queer manga Institute's work and the work of Shakespeare and Company. And I'm not the first to discover this overlap. It's actually spoken about in Richard Schechner's book, The Future of Ritual, which came out in 1993. And he specifically said that Felicitas Goodman's work, which explores ritual, is similar to theater because there's a kind of catharsis for the participant. And I would take it one step further and say it's even more than catharsis. I think there's the kind of transcendence. And I've been in on the Saturday sessions during um, ecstatic trans postures and I've heard people's stories. And 
I'm absolutely blown away. These aren't just like hallucinations. They're really seeing what's there. And it's, um, it's a vision trip and it's a communication with spirit. So I, I do think this work actually does parallel the research of the Institute. Um, bringing it back to my experience. So uh, I came to Shakespeare and Company, you had to prepare a monologue. I didn't think a lot of it, but I decided to go with Cleopatra's suicide speech. Because I liked the language, there were a few words that really stood out to me. So that's what I went with. And I got there and I pulled my director aside. I said to him, I think I know what this speech is about. I think I've only recently mortalized. And he's like, okay, I think it's about something else. And uh, I didn't know what he meant. So the next day I came and I did the speech and he just said to me really honestly, he said, uh, who close to you has died? And my first thought was, how does he know? And then I said, um, well, my dad died when I was five. And he said, okay, I'm going to have you cast someone in this room to play your five-year-old self. And I'm going to ask you to speak the speech to her. And in this moment, everything changed because Paul, as you talk about, it went from an idea of an experience to a lived experience. It went from the idea of text to a true text. And, and what, what happened was I, I sort of stopped acting and I just gave myself permission to live and it became a lot more interesting. Um, so I'm going to share with you the language of the text right now. And obviously it's not transcendence every time, but I do want to just share the words that that provided me with a kind of scaffolding to go into an emotional cave and then come back out again. And it was Shakespeare who gave me that scaffolding, that structure. So the text is, give me my robe, put on my crown. I have immortal longings in me now no more. The juice of Egypt's grape shall moist this lip. Iris, lawn farewell. If thou and nature can so gently part. The stroke of death is as a lover's pinch, which hurts and is desired. Dost thou lie still? If thus thou vanish, thou tells the world, it is not worth leave taking. Um, so I spoke this speech and I realized that through the language, it gave me permission to forgive my dad for dying because what I discovered in the speech was that Cleopatra doesn't die for herself, she dies for Egypt. And I didn't even realize I was holding on to this um, tension until I did it. The point of theater though, isn't to just heal yourself, it's to then be generous and to share your work with the group, like Laura was saying, to have an experience or a dream and then to share it with a group in a community. Um, so, what wound up happening though, is I felt like Cleopatra offered me a little bit of healing in my heart. And I left Shakespeare and Company, I continued to live my life. I found myself at the London School of Economics and I was really excited because it's um, one of the best schools in the world, or at least that's what I had been told. But when I got there, I started to see that there was this structure of top-down management, that there was no permission to be yourself at that school. It was um, professors would dictate to you how you felt and how you thought. And so in order to achieve success at that school, you just had to say what the professor told you to say. It was like, it was what I would later discover, it was the patriarchy, a system that is rooted in trauma and that ruptures relationships. But I only came to that conclusion after reading Carol Gilligan's book, 
which is Darkness Now Visible. And I highly recommend it, um, where she shows us that there's a structure in the world that actually hurts both men and women because it prioritizes some men over other men and all men over women. Um, it also values stoicism over relationship and it values intellect over emotion. So when I, when I read this book and I realized there was a system in the world, I thought, oh my God, what is this? I felt like I was waking up to something and I was like, there must be someone in Shakespeare who can understand what I'm going through. And I found her and it's Ophelia. Um, so everyone knows Hamlet and everyone knows the to be or not to be speech because it's profound. But what people don't know about that scene is that Hamlet's a hero in that monologue. But after that scene, he's kind of a jerk and he's a jerk to Ophelia. So what makes the scene interesting, if we're talking about patriarchy, which obviously Padre, it has to do with the father. Hamlet has the ghost of his father working through him, demanding retributive justice. Ophelia has her literal father in the room telling her, you need to go, you need to break up with Hamlet. Your relationship isn't real, he's using you. And so both of these characters have their father's voices in their heads and in their bodies. So when they come together, there's, there's I'm using this as a metaphor for two characters who have internalized the patriarchy. So when they come together, instead of um, repairing the relationship, they continue to rupture it. So Hamlet and Ophelia are in the room. Hamlet tells her to go to a nunnery, which is a convent or a whorehouse. And the line he says to her before her soliloquy is we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one shall survive. To which Ophelia says, oh, what a noble mind is here o'erthrown. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, I, time sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down, and I, of ladies, most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh that unmatched form and stature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy oh woe is me to have seen what i have seen to see what i see I find this piece so powerful because it is a woman waking up. And that's what I invite my sisters to do today is to really wake up and see that it's not the human who is hurting you. <laughs> it's the system of patriarchy and we've got to do what we can. We've got to do what we can to equalize it. Um, and one way to do that is to bring and honor democracy because that is the opposite of patriarchy, giving voice, giving equal voice to people in the room. That's one of the best things we can do, at least for now. They say that there's an evolution of something greater than democracy, but so for now I would advocate democracy. And, what makes this scene interesting is that I actually think in that moment, Ophelia has the chance to heal the wound between her and Hamlet, but he's not in the room when she says that. And this goes back to that idea of listening. It has to do with using our voice and hearing each other, but there's still not a guarantee. And <laughs> I'd like to then showcase another female character who, 
says what she means and means what she says. <laughs> and you can decide if she gets through to him or not, but it's Titania and Oberon. So they meet for the first time in the fairy world and they haven't seen each other in a long time. And they're bickering back and forth. They've been lovers forever. Um, they're bickering back and forth and about whose turf is what and who's having an affair with who and all sorts of stuff. And um, what Titania says to Oberon is, these are the forgeries of jealousy. And never since middle summer spring met we on hill, in dale, forest, or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the beached margin of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds piping to us in vain as in revenge have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs which falling in the land have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain. The plowman lost his sweat. The green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. The human mortals want their winter cheer. <clears throat> no night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And through this distemperature, we see the seasons alter. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, the angry winter change their wanted liveries and the mazed world by their increase knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. <clears throat> So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, so that's what Titania says to Oberon, to which he says, do you amend it then it lies in you? Why should Titania cross her Oberon? So, okay, we still can't get there quite. Like she speaks her piece, he's not listening. But what Carol Gilligan points out, and this is what I think is critical, is that it's not about relationships not rupturing. It's about relationships rupturing and us being able to find each other again. And that's where I get excited because it means we don't have to be perfect, but we have to keep trying. And Carol points out there are these two myths that we can choose as Western culture. We can choose the Oedipus Rex myth or we can choose the myth of Eros and Psyche. So in Oedipus Rex, the myth essentially says <clears throat> that violence in men, silence in women, and it's rooted in trauma, and that isolationism is, a, is the strategy. Um, what Carol says is the way to move out of this paradigm and into maybe a more evolved one is for women <clears throat> who so often say, I don't know, to switch and for us to say, I do know. And for men who so often say, I don't care, um, to move into saying, I do care, I care. Uh, and that would give us the gift of the ears and psyche myth, which is one of voice and curiosity in women and one of embodiment and care in men. Um, and this, she says, would lead to the birth of pleasure. So that's why I wanted to share these pieces on Valentine's Day. Um, and to remind us that deep listening, a piece of that is to put our own pain aside and to really hear the people who we're engaged with, um, even just for a minute. And the last thing I'll say is a piece of text from Juliet that always rings true to me. Um, and she says, my bounty is as boundless as the sea. 
my love as deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have. For both are infinite. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Boy, your passion really shines through. Thank you, Ellie, for <laughs> elucidating this whole passage. So Shakespeare was really understanding something deep for his, especially for his era. What was he trying to do with his women characters, do you think? What was he giving voice to overall? Well, Tina it Packer of so Shakespeare Company. Well read, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. She would say that that Shakespeare, Shakespeare's women. I mean, this is what my directors say as I work on this process. They say Shakespeare's women are a little better than Shakespeare's men, but Shakespeare's men have power. <laughs> and so they're, they're characters who are living very much in a system defined by patriarchy. And oftentimes it's, you know, if we look at Brutus and Portia, it's Brutus who's deciding, am I gonna murder Caesar? And it's Portia who's like asking him to go back to his heart and his conscience. So in the plays, it tends to be the women um, advocating for the emotional core. And, and I think that's why these women are so resilient because I think that parallels a lot of conversations women are having today. And they're fascinating because they're daring and they're smart and they're wise and they speak well um, as well. They're worthy of being heard. Shakespeare's day um, was so patriarchal <laughs> that women were not allowed to appear on the stage. And so all the female characters were played by men. That, that says something about the era, doesn't it? Well, it does. And people bring this up to me a lot. And, and it's definitely a commentary on the era, but I don't think it makes the characters less accessible to living, breathing women. Like I do think he captured these qualities of divine, divine feminine. <laughs> Um, I also appreciate about Shakespeare that often some of his plays, especially the romantic comedies, are about something's gone wrong, the wrong couples are attracted to one another, even the love potion that Titania drinks to make her um, uh, in love with a, with a hybrid human. Yeah, uh, say, donkey. Water. Yeah. <laughs> So, but by the end of the play, because nature reflects the affairs of man on earth and vice versa, that nature can only go back to rights once the right couples are in right relationship. So yeah. I thought that was also a very profound understanding from our distant yeah. past coming forward in this way, that what we do affects that realm and that realm affects us. There's this interrelationship. So Definitely. I find that very profound and that we need to live in right relationship in order for the world to turn, to keep spinning, and uh, for the rains to come on time, for, the, for nature to be at peace. So yeah. right relation is about co-equal and right relation between men and women. Let's sort it out here. I think if we're really gonna pull from ancient wisdom forward, because we are so out of balance, part of that is women have been pushed to the sidelines as many others have been. Um, mm -hmm. We need to sort this out. Our ancient ancestors did a good job of it. They had women's council, they had men's council, women had a voice for most of these cultures. We mm -hmm. can check with the Van Pools next week on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's gonna present an example where women did come in to the fore and say, let's heal this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is something we need to do. Yeah, it's, it's something that I think is critical actually. I think that, and you hear it in Titania's speech that she's saying like, our brawls are affecting the like global warming. That she, she says it's affecting the water, it's affecting the weather, the moon is angry, the air has disease in it. I mean, I can't help but be like, that is the world I'm literally looking out on today. And I don't think that we have struck yet a sustainable balance between the divine feminine, divine masculine. I think it's off balance. I actually think it impacts our world. 
and and how we are going about our world as well isn't it mm-hmm. so we heal that and we heal a lot yeah so it's worth and i also was thinking you know uh this is a gift giving occasion and i would just posit that one of the greatest gifts a man can give to a woman whether it's a mother a daughter a wife a sister whatever it is your community is the gift of listening to be heard is the greatest yeah. gift um, I know that, gosh, I grew up in a family where you were expected to be heard, but only on the condition that you were saying something intelligent and coherent and useful. You know, you had to like earn the right to be heard. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least you were heard. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's why I think um, just being heard is such a gift and that women get out of balance when they're not heard, when they're not understood, when they're not given a chance. So, um, love yeah. and eros. Explain that a little bit further, if you would. Going from Oedipus, Oedipus Rex to um, eros and psyche. Elucidate yeah. that, if you would, for us. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, I read this article that Carol wrote, and it's the loss of pleasure, or why are we still talking about Oedipus? And it just kind of showed me how, like this kind of hero's journey very much grounded in like the Joseph Campbell understanding of storytelling is like, it's, it, it's such a like a uh, lonely journey. It's like stoicism and independence and like um, removing yourself from community. And there's just so many elements of it that I think are in Oedipus Rex. But what we forget is that like Oedipus Rex starts off with a son being separated from his mother, which is true. Trauma. And so his actions in that myth are actions informed by trauma. And he's like a violent character. He, you know, murders um, his own father. So like why we have that myth on a pedestal is, is concerning. Although I do think that trauma reactions and patriarchy go hand in hand. And Carol argues that's kind of why we hold on to the patriarchy because it keeps us a little bit removed from our feelings. And that's a trauma reaction. Um, Eros and Psyche, on the other hand, it's a complicated myth and I've read it several times. At first I didn't get it because I was like, he scolds her the first time. Like she brings in a hot candle Iris is in disguise. She brings in a hot candle to see him. Some of the wax drips on him and wakes him up out of slumber. And he scolds her and leaves. And I'm like, this doesn't sound great. But what happens is that it kind of maps out these archetypal journeys for men and women. For for the woman, the archetypal journey is to go to hell and then back again. And that's part of her like self um individuation as a human I guess you can read about it in Robert Johnson's books and for the for the male journey it's to um, slay dragons and just search for the holy grail so there's this idea that you can like have a little taste of bliss when you're around like 14 and then you spend your whole life trying to get back to that bliss but uh, if we can kind of follow those archetypes uh the idea being it ends with the literal birth of a daughter and they name her pleasure. You know, these, um, these myths are there in our subterranean cultural consciousness, aren't they? And so it's really mm-hmm. helpful to pull them up and examine them to see what they really contain and are we really needing to follow them? and what new myths might we want to bring in. This is a cathartic uh, process, I think. What's there that we're responding to that we're not even aware of because it's so deeply embedded in our, in our culture or our physiology or what, what have you. Explain a little more about Schechner. I did, you recommended that book to me long ago. I ordered it, I have it. I just haven't read it. But tell me about Ritual and, and uh, this mentor of yours and what he had to say about Goodman. Yeah, well, he, so the Quinga stuff doesn't actually appear until like the like last 20 pages of the book. And, but I got really excited and I saw that it was in Santa Fe and I was just like, I love Santa Fe. So, so I got extra excited. Um, but he, the argument he makes is that 
what ritual strives to achieve and what good theater strives to achieve is a religious experience. Um, and I don't think he's wrong when saying that. I think that contemporary theater is one of our Western rituals. I think for me, one of my criticisms of Western culture is that we don't have a lot of rituals. And in particular, I think we could do more to have a coming of age ritual. But as a theater goer and living in New York, at least before COVID, I had a ritual of going to the theater and gathering with strangers and and watching these characters like go through their own catharsis. And that was the word that that he used. And he said that it, with ecstatic trance, it's a catharsis of the participant. And he makes the argument that theater is a catharsis of the audience. But I would take it one step further and say it's actually a catharsis of the actor and the audience. I even think that the giant ball courts of the Mayan and our football games of today are ritualistic and that they mm. have this shared, shared group mind, just doing the wave as a group. I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting kind of bonding. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's such yeah. a need for theater and we've, um, we've put this out in, in different ways. Um, it, it's interesting like that. And it's got all the, the elements that harken back so early, early on, music and um, performance and costume and objects of ritual objects, whether it be a football or, or something else. Uh, it's really interesting. We had, we have um, Bridget, Brigitte Vies from oh, Germany, yeah. who is kind of the maestro of Oktoberfest in Munich, yeah. who is going to give us, and I've heard her lecture before, but she's going to give us a whole, uh, in future, whole lecture on how Oktoberfest itself is a shared community ritual. And the drinking cool. and the um, the songs that they sing and this kind of shared uh, ecstasy and revelry. It's really interesting. So we can find ritual in kind of the most interesting incarnations, I think, uh, going. It's just, we Definitely. have such a need for that. I think it's so deeply embedded in us. So is it, is it, that... it produces an emotional sequence. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. We even have a rock star friend who said that his playlist is geared for taking your emotions from one place up to a crescendo and back down again. Mm -hmm. I think it's a shared ritual, even going to a rock concert. All right. Mm, absolutely. I think that's absolutely you know, yeah. find that. So maybe that's that's a dysfunction of Western culture where we we have separated ourselves out from that over here is acting in a play and over here is ritual and over here is this and this this is that. And yet in, in these Traditional cultures, there's an integration of these functions so that when the shaman performs, yes, it's yes, it's theater, but it's beyond theater. It's 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 a cultural gathering together in the taking a little journey that we all can can participate in. And so now in modern days, maybe we're going to be returning with the youth like yourself that's understanding the combination of of taking the the profession of acting and the profession of theater and seeing where that can go where that can maybe that uh, you can see how it affects people and how that can um, bring us back to to maybe something that's core within humanity that we've always had or like Schechner says that we strive for a religious experience mm -hmm. i would say that even the spirits when we go into trance are putting on rather a bit of a theater for us that there are animal spirits, there's scenery, mm -hmm. there's an object, there's a lesson, there's a release, mm -hmm. there's a revelation, there's a message that I think that is so deeply embedded in us because that is one of the languages of spirit. The there's theater. visuals, there's often music that we hear over the rattle. There's there's all those elements at play. The You've been through this. What would you say about that? You're the theater expert. Am I on to... Well... <laughs> I don't think we can, we can ever the be an expert loosely. at the theater, but, um, but we're always beginners at the theater, but uh, I have had a lot of experiences and to go off what you're saying, um, one thing I think is exciting and connects to the trans dance and trans postures is that like, you guys always say to not like 
dream up visuals, but to allow the visuals to come to you and like see what's actually there. Mm -hmm. And theater is that, I mean, it only works if you allow it to come kind of like from the ground up and not from the top down. I'd say, and so I had this experience where I was playing Portia in Merchant of Venice and I was supposed to have a ring and I like put the ring, I like felt something in the palm of my hand and I looked there and I could feel the weight of the ring. I could see the light of the gold. I could see the ring, but it wasn't real. I mean, but was it real? There wasn't a material ring in my hand, but it was a real ring, I swear. <laughs> and that's what the visions are, I think, when people see the visions. Yeah. 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 Any impact our senses that way? Do we have um, comments from the audience? Do we have anything Lena, in the chat room? Lena has a hand up. Hi, Lena. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Ellie, so much for your wonderful talk and like leading us into this Shakespeare world and mm -hmm. gender questions and all that stuff. And also for the great introduction to you, Paul and, and Laura. And um, so I was wondering about the religious um, aspect of theater, if, it, if this is at all discussed in your department or in your, you know, so as far as I understood, you study um, acting in theory and practice, right? Um, at NYU, yes, but I am at the Gallatin School, so I get to take classes from a few other departments, but yeah. So, so I was wondering if, like, the is there if there is any scholarly reflection about the religious aspect in in acting, or you know, um, or or was it your personal discovery to to draw on uh, Shekna? Do, do um, you know what, you know what I mean? I do, I do. Um, I I think that what people describe their experience in theater and at the theater. To me, I would use the word religious experience, but more often than not, I think that there's a, a little bit of like a, they don't want to label it religious. Um, yeah. It's a connection with spirit. Everyone has their own vocabulary. I'm comfortable with the word religious experience, but I think that, it would be the kind of thing where like it's describing the same thing or transcendence, but uh, Schechner really was the one who used that word and he tied it to the Cuenca Institute. And Goodman used religious experience, not in terms of religion, but in mm -hmm. terms of crossing that magical threshold mm -hmm. in having that fully embodied experience of something larger than yourself. It was an accepted mm -hmm. term within the yeah. anthropological community, especially at that time. I'm, I'm yeah. going to ask Christine, I'm sure still to this day. but It denotes yeah. ecstasy going from mm -hmm. the stasis outside of yourself. Right. You are extending beyond oneself. We all have had those experiences, those moments. Yeah. Today it's Tell us a bit. I mean, you have some. You, were you not a graduate of the music um, Mozartium? Yeah. You've been to the Institute, Lena. You are a graduate yeah. of the Mozartium in Austria, I believe. The, the Mozartium, yeah. yeah. Right, correct. Um, yes, me, wow, I'm I'm impressed you still remember, <laughs> Laura. Um, yes, I like I'm a music and dance teacher, but actually not right now I'm a re religious scholar um, or I'm writing a PhD thesis. And so so I'm interested in the connections between arts and religion as well. So that's more or less the reason for my question. I want to hear more about your research. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I will still. I still have to write an email to you. I know. Thank you. <laughs> Please do. Thank you. Please do. I mean, this yeah. is one of the benefits of the Zoom thing that we didn't have previously. Is we can stay in touch with beautiful people like Lena and and follow, directly. follow up. Yeah, directly yeah. and follow up on their their lives and the research that they're bringing forward. And yeah, thank you so much, Lena, for finding us and coming back again and being a part of this. Yeah. 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 See you. I'm gonna go to John next. I'm gonna. Um, where are you, John? Up here. Go to our uh, ad, John. Okay, John, you got a question. John. Oh, can't hear you. Yeah, give him a second. Takes a moment to unmute. There he is. Okay, I think I'm off mute now. <clears throat> anyway, uh, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Um, I hadn't really thought about ritual and uh, theater, but it, it made me think about something. Uh, speaking of religion, 
uh, I, I've just uh, recently uh, uh, kind of reading on this subject found that uh, one of the bases of religion is animism that they all kind of have in common where uh, you talk about gods and spirits and demons and souls and, and these kinds of things. So in a sense, in, when I see a, a person and even yourself here uh, uh, reading and acting, you almost become imbued with the spirit of the uh, character and it becomes you, you you're transformed. So I see a very strong spiritual or religious connection in that, in that sense. Uh, and so it, 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 it seems to flow. And uh, one other comment I have is that uh, we talk about the patriarchal society uh, and trauma and the warrior mentality. And I think that uh, uh, back in um, the village and, and uh, early man, let's just say Paleolithic times was uh, where the men were the ones who were the warriors. So they had the mm -hmm. tools of war, they had the uh, weapons and the women didn't so much participate in that. And uh, that made them uh, extremely dangerous in a sense. And football players are in fact our modern warriors and they're very, uh, as someone pointed out. Uh, so since they had the monopoly on uh, lethal weaponry uh, that puts a woman at a great disadvantage in any discussions. Mm -hmm. Plus it was patriarchal and uh, uh, patrilocal. The women had to move to the men's camp and, instead of the women going to her camp, her parents mm -hmm. where she had uh, allies. So I think there's hope because I think we're seeing now more equality even in the uh, warrior class, if we want to use that uh, term. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a niece who's learning how to fly a Black Hawk helicopter. <laughs> so, uh, wow. you know, I mean, so so this, this need to differentiate the men and the women apart from uh, these kinds of uh, pursuits are equalizing in a sense, and I think going into the future, mm -hmm. I think we'll see more of that. Uh, but it is a problem. Um, I, 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 I agree with you 100%. Mm. It's a discussion yeah. we can have now. Go ahead, Ellie. Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to say too that like, I was just uh, working with my director. Uh, we're actually turning this into a short film for the thesis. Um, but I was working with him and he said, what makes it so interesting is that like this patriarchal structure that we're talking about really disconnects boys from their feelings before they even have the language to name how they're feeling. And it starts at like the age of three or four. And so for women, the initiation into the patriarchy comes more at like 13, 14, but for men, and that just broke my heart to think that maybe that's why there's a stereotype that like men aren't as emotional as women, maybe partly because the connection is broken before they have the grasp of an emotional vocabulary. Um, and so I do think we're all emotional and intellectual beings, but I also do believe in like a nurturing mother or a father who wants to hold space for his home. You know, there's, there's gotta be a way to have gender differences that are, can live outside of the patriarchy. Mm. I, I will I will add one more thing to that is that in the warrior class yeah. for for eons where we were training our our young boys and and young men to be warriors, uh, one of the uh, one of, one of the characteristics we we actually consciously bred into them was to be unfeeling, and mm. remorseless so that you could kill in yeah. battle. So that was that was consciously right. um, imposed on on males, if you will. So they're yeah. not gonna be very feeling because <laughs> they had to fight and kill in battle. What yeah. the society asks of you to sacrifice and give up so that you can perform on its behalf mm -hmm. that you're not realizing. Mm. Yeah. And how many yeah. parents raised us where keep a stiff upper yeah. lip, don't bother me with your emotions because it's inconvenient for me mm -hmm. because they had not the tools to deal with it. Right. How are you? And right. to be raised without your mother, you mentioned the character cut off from his mother, mm -hmm. be cut off from feminine wisdom. But men today, you're right. They are more involved in childcare, more involved in housework, mm. uh, more involved in conversation. Right. So, I mean, what a gift to the men as well to right. be able to be fully fully human and present. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I so we are, we're making great strides. Yeah. yeah. Little and, by little. And even firsthand having a father who was a Marine and having that, that, you know, that, 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 that masculine 
macho macho thing that was like impossible for me to relate to as a young man is like how do i follow these footsteps where do i fit in you know i'm not a hunter right. but i'm going to go out and kill animals i don't understand <laughs> all of this it was like very right. very challenging for me to find my way but i also didn't want to be a sissy i wanted to find out where it all works and so yeah i'm sure yeah. We, that's that's the challenge that john pointed out is that there's been this ingrained thing that we have to have no feelings or something and uh, right and i like and that's why i think Oh, well, that's just why I think that um, an understanding of this patriarchal structure and how it hurts both men and women. I mean, women, we know it hurts us, but men are also suffering from this. So that's why it's something that I think is worth talking about. Yeah. If you shame yeah. feminine qualities, then you're shaming them for men also. They can't go there. They can't enlist well, in that Exactly. As well. and, yeah. I, and I can add, you know, as we as we I've conducted, I don't know, three or four uh, men's conclave at the Institute. And by men's conclave, mm -hmm. immediately people think of uh, the uh, Iron John, uh, Robert Bly stuff way back with the drumming and the thing in the woods and all that stuff. But, you know, we really wanted to try to take it up a notch and get to that sacred masculine that you're talking about and that, mm -hmm. that there's a sensitivity there and and. Uh, um, in fact, we had men very specifically say, if that's the, you know, if it's the old school men's, men's thing, I'm not attending. Or is it something more than that? So yes, mm. that's what we're after. You're after finding something that, that's in that element of sacred. And so you referred to sacred masculine in the I beginning mean, and feminine together, balanced. And um, it's just a journey that uh, I, I um, think all of us want to participate in. And we're just trying to find our way where that balance is. I mean, hearing about the the men's retreats, that is exciting to me. That's really exciting because I also think that young men need to hear that. And I think that as a young person, I can just speak to this, that like, it, there's this perversion in our gender equality seeking where, where the goal is to like have both parties have a voice and have a spirit. But what I'm seeing among young people is that we're continuing the master slave dynamic, but we're just taking turns who gets to be the master and who gets to be the slave. Um, and, uh, and that has kind of blown my mind. Cause I'm like, that still isn't gender equality. Exactly. You know, we attended a, in Santa Clara Pueblo in Santa Fe, we attended a huge gathering on a solstice that the women's council had put on yes and so we were gathering in a circle and they did a ceremony to greet the sun and then afterwards they opened up to, to who wants to speak and there was a beautiful powerful woman mm. from i think she was from new york city from oh. an inner borough of a neighborhood that there was a lot of strife and conflict and drive-by shootings she was describing and just chaos and she said that she came back the second year to thank them because the first year they had talked about what really are men's roles to be the protector to protect the women mm -hmm. and children the environment the the culture the community right. and she said it gave her the idea to go back to her inner city borough and to put on a breakfast to attract the men and she said they will hear me if i feed them and oh, wow. so they came to this breakfast and she said, thank you for coming. And I want to tell you what I have learned from the Women's Council of, of Santa Fe, um, these beautiful indigenous Pueblo women who have a community where cool. the men step up to protect the culture, the land, mm -hmm. the environment, the women, the children. She said, men, what are you doing? Mm. You're harming us. Mm. You're not playing your sacred role. Mm -hmm. Listen to us. We need you. We need you to step up to your authentic, divine, right selves mm -hmm. and be there for us right. and protect us. And she said they, she just looked the look on their faces that it dawned on them. She said, you know, it, we, I got through to them mm -hmm. because I was speaking the truth. Yeah. And so she had made such strides in that change and for them to dialogue with her that she had to come back and we got to hear her in the aftermath thank them right and i thought well wow let's we need we need to hear the the eternal wisdom the real true right. sacred roles that we are here to play in order to step up 
We need yeah. the role models from the ancestors. She wanted to give we them a different voices. definition of tribe, of being a part yeah. of a gang and how that gang con mentality of being part of a tribe can transition into something very positive to protect the, the, your family and your culture around yourself. It was a very powerful speech, it was very a very powerful. powerful message she shared. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, thank so, you, John. Do you think you get your men are given these strengths and these tools for a reason? Step up. Oh, also, we went to another. There was the whole pipeline issue, and we went to another. I can say that story. Yeah. So they're they're uh, in the northwest, uh, up in the Salish culture. Uh, the native peoples decided that they were they're gonna they were gonna start transporting oil or something through the through these islands and it was like very disturbing what was happening um with the with the oil industry was taking control of these pathways and it's among the most pristine beautiful places on the planet and one spill would just ruin it all and the the they got together and they carved a totem pole and they took this huge totem pole on the back of a truck and they wanted to go from city to city to town to town from, from Washington State all the way over to, to, I think, Michigan and around, and they did, did a big loop. Um, in each place, they would stand up on the back of the truck and they would give speeches. And Laura and I attended this one in Friday Harbor, Washington. It was the evening time, it was quiet, and they were on the coastline. And this elder from the tribe, uh, just across the bay, I can't remember, um, he got up and he's- and Lummi, he, it was Lummi. Lummi, the Lummi tribe. And uh, he stood up, and as he spoke, the, the mountains and the walls of the, the area just echoed with his voice. And he said, and he just, and he was saying, the women, the women are stepping up. Where are the men? Men, what are you doing? I mean, he, his voice, his intensity shakes my soul to this day. The intensity of his message saying, we have to do these things. That's what it means to be a warrior. You fight for protecting your land, you protect your water, you protect the food around you, protect your children, that's being a warrior. And when he spoke, like I said, I'm still getting chills at his message and I recorded that message and I kept it, I keep it on file because it's just one of those messages I wanna to return to and remember that you know, to be a warrior has a different meaning if you take a moment to, to step back and, and reflect on, on how it could be a very powerful meaning. Not just our borders, but our entire world right. needs yeah. protecting. Yeah. So it was a, yeah. it was a shaking but impressive message that we needed to hear. I, I also wanted to mention in the chat room that Cameron said, I am a Marine. And I want to say that my, my reflection of my father is one of great admiration and strength. And I'm not in any way uh, putting down the concept of becoming a military service person. In fact, I feel the opposite. I'm, I'm admiring that position and that someone could can step up and, and play that role. But my father was also from a different generation. And so he was much more, uh, as a young man, it impacted his entire life about holding certain principles. He had ethics, he had principles, the way that he conducted his life. I think it was all military. It just brought through so many great messages, but that sensitivity aspect of his life, he couldn't open that part. That was the part. Right, and I want to speak to that too, actually, because um, hearing you speak, there's an artist in New York who was uh, in military service and he started to realize that like, he has a whole program called Decruit like there's so much programming into recruiting, but he said there's not a lot of decruiting going on. And he found that actually, again, in Shakespeare, he found the Shakespeare had warriors who had seen great tragedy and gave language to what they were experiencing. And so he actually has brought Shakespeare text into this decruiting program for people who have experienced tragedy and horror that we can't even fathom necessarily. Yeah. yeah. And, and one other personal story, I have a brother who served two terms in Vietnam, double terms during some of the most horrific times, the things that he went through. And the Vietnam War was one which in this country, when you came back, there was no parades. It was not one where you were honored for your service. And so it, it, this young man at you know, 18, 19 years old and how his entire life has been impacted by that. And I can see it when he talks, when he speaks, he loves his family, he's quiet, he does his thing, but um, it, his life maybe would have been totally different had he not served. But I so so there's that. Or is there a way to a serve? Is there a way to serve and step as a warrior, but also Come back. retain? Yeah, retain. Mm -hmm. They can't even speak of it. 
my father, your father, so many of our fathers couldn't give voice to what they'd been through. Right. And I don't mean to so, take the conversation to just that, yeah. but I, that was one of the uh, shares. Well, that, men in balance can, can, yeah. means that women can be in balance. That's the conversation. Right? That but there can be balance. room for both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christine, Let's take some more. Christine says he would like to share. And I know, Christine, you're having a problem with internet connection, so you don't have to turn on your video list if you yeah. want to. But I'd love to hear your, your uh, comments. Yeah. Um, there is so much that one could say going back to gender relationships, but also art and shamanism. Um, and ritual. So I don't know what you would like for me to, to speak on. I know that at one point you called me out on the ritual with anthropology. So I'm, I'm game. What would, I don't know what you, Ellie, you did a fabulous job and I appreciate all you do. And thank you for sharing with us. And I'm glad you found a place where professors allow you to be create creative. I think so importantly, sitting on this side of the professor table, I always hope that my students will be highly creative and, and do their own thing. And so I think that means a great deal um, to to the world at large. But anything you want me to comment on, anything specific you want to ask of me? Well, As somebody who does religious rituals, all that fun stuff. Yeah, and the term religious altered states is what we had referred to at one moment. I just wanted to say that it's, you know, like Laura said, it doesn't just mean the traditional idea of what people think of religion. That it thinks it's, 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 it's a term within the anthropological community that has meaning. And we said, right. we you can elucidate that next week as we'll have both you and Todd. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of this. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, well, and I, I do like what you said about Felicitas with its uh, ritual is she talks about ritual being the doorway to unlock the spirit world. And she's very clear about that in several of her books. So she would say that ritual is the doorway to, to all this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also from your, your background and experience, Christine talked talking about how the shamans of traditional cultures are are the original theater. Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You wanna to speak to that for a moment? Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot of shamans understood that the, the ritual, the drama, the ceremony, that calling in all the spirits and being able to project it and also in a sense, make people believe it. And maybe one thing, if you as a practitioner believe it, but it's another, phenomenon to get people involved, have people feel what you feel, um, experience what you're um, experiencing and, and passing that on to, to your clients, your community. That's such an integral part of what shamans do. And I don't mean to use the word magic and camp can testify to this. I'm not a fan of magic or sympathetic magic, but in a commonsensical way, that's really what the shaman and the religious practitioner or the ceremonialist is doing is theater, if you will, a form of magic to convey these important truths. And I know Cam could talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. I also think that even being in an audience when there is some really wonderful ritual or theater going on, right. um, it transports you. We use the term suspended disbelief. Right. I think that is a mild trance state where you are it is. opening up to receive and you are taken in your brain to a new level. I think part of that is the mirror neurons that you Absolutely. are, mm -hmm. it's like a tuning fork. They ring a certain frequency and you pick up on that and reflect that and something in you opens and something in you shifts. It's like going for that religious experience. And I had this wonderful uh uh, experience joining a Zoom that Brian Tucker invited me to with the mm. Deep Time Network. Yes. And where uh, Jennifer, the founder, uh, was having a poem, a song, a conversation, a description of allurement mm -hmm. um, as a scientific principle in the cosmos, a force similar to gravity, and that they were explaining this evolving conscious awake universe in intellectual terms and putting some science and mytho poetry to it and just talking about it in those terms. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very moving. And I had to say, um, you all are using from an intellectual perspective to describe and, and, and talk about the universe in this way that we have from direct experience. Mm -hmm. And I am just as moved yeah. to celebrate that is to awaken it and to activate those connections, those deep connections. Yeah. I think to have this poetry, as I see Frank Ortiz in the audience, describing these beautiful epic 
poems to celebrate the love of the universe, the embrace of the universe, is also to activate that as it is to have these direct experience. To theater just puts more color, more sensory apparatus that we have to invoke to celebrate and make those connections. Mm. I think these are, it's a way to have a full bodied experience you know, is to have all that theater can bring to us in terms of costume, voice, dance, music, all of that. Shakespeare employed all of that. Um, yeah, and I like to hear you say that because I do think that as Westerners, we're kind of just like, well, I could watch a movie or I could go to the theater, but it's, there is a difference and yeah. it has to do with that community and sharing breath and breathing in the same air that that actor breathed his vibrations into. And I mean, that is why this pandemic where we can't share breath is particularly challenging for me. Um, but, but there are vibrations in those rooms that I don't wanna lose sight of the experience of attending the theater. Well, you know, I agree with that. I agree with that. It's the people sitting next to you. You're all vibrating at this. Um, you mm -hmm. have this shared moment in the room. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. very deep. One of the things that uh, Dr. Goodman, Felicitas, also did is that she created puppets and did puppet shows for the local children right. of the Pueblo. She would have them all come up to the, the Institute. Before and, it was the Institute. <laughs> before, yeah, and she yeah. would perform stories of their own to the children to, so they could learn their own stories. We still have those puppets at the Institute that Felicitas had made and she she had she had uh, written out the entire uh, We script, have her files. Her files of scripts yeah, of how her she- plays. Her written. plays and how she, she yeah, exactly. And and some yeah. of the people who are adults now, uh, when they meet us, oh, yeah. you're with the, oh yes, the white grandmother. The white grandmother. Oh, we used to go and she used to put on these plays there that you can see them. These big grizzly guys Animated. working at the gas station. It's about 50 years old. And he's he like, all of a sudden he's six years old again. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's so, that memorable. Yeah. yeah. And didn't we all put on little plays when we were kids? Mm -hmm. I know my sister was, uh, she's a photographer, um, professional. And uh, as kids, we used to dress up and she used to take pictures so we could we could play act uh, for photographs. Yeah. And Dory made a, you know, Dory made the comment in the chat room because um, she's attended probably four <laughs> mass trans, trans dances. dances. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, just the, the profound... Um, impact that that's added, that's the ultimate theater for us to do, to go in together, to have the experience of these ecstatic trance postures and these experiences of ecstatic trance states. From there, to get the dialogue, to get the information, to, to lay out the entire script of what's gonna happen. This is not something that's predetermined and we tell people, don't come with a costume prepared because you don't know what your costume is going to be. <laughs> but if you want to bring some supplies, maybe you're going to bring some feathers and some felt and some stuff. And then when you get here, you can give it to other people who have different swap. You know, yeah. Swap out somebody else. Somebody else got the bear, the bear <laughs> claw or whatever. You know. It's, cool. So so all of a sudden we have these incredible things. And so Dr. Goodman used to spend significant time detailing and typing out and having these specific uh, visions all visions. put like strings on a bead yes. to create a story that was actually coherent and had a common theme Ultimate running through theater. and it had meaning. And so it was yeah. a group download that was a coherent story from the spirits. It was, yeah, yeah it was quite, um, quite something to see, pop in here? formulate. Yeah, Who's, who wants to pop in? Me. Hi, Cameron, go ahead. Cameron. Um, Real quickly, talking about warriors and also ritual theater, both. Mm -hmm. um, have you guys ever heard of Ken Kuthlane? He was an author who did a lot of work. He, he's a pagan author, honestly, but he did a lot of work on uh, the uh, the notion of the uh, the warrior mindset, uh, the divine masculine. Anyway, he was a police officer and a uh, service member out of, out of Canada, and he did a lot of work on these ideas. And one of the things that he, the concepts he came up with that really appealed to me is this notion of the divine masculine uh, in the aspects of being the warrior. Now, speaking in, in the talk, speaking, talking about ritual theater, one of the things he talks about is the idea that the police officer, because I was a cop for 20 years, too. Mm -hmm. oh. um, is that um, the police officer has become a law enforcement officer in many ways, has become the shaman of the modern sense. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And one of the reasons that he says this, and from my own personal experience, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was a police officer, I uh, worked in an area, I worked as a deputy sheriff, I worked in an area where I had a lady who was an older elderly lady who was not quite um, right in the head, honestly. And uh, she was fairly convinced that uh, she had FBI agents that would be in her yard all the time. And what roughly, roughly once a month, we had to go out there and give, take a call to a residence. And we had to go out there and assure her the FBI agents were not out to get her, okay? So what I would do is I would go out and I have a little black bag with me and I would go to her house, all right? And I'd talk to her, drink some tea, uh, talk to her about her life, what's going on, all right? And then I'd say, okay, I'm gonna go take care of the FBI agents. And I walk outside and I walk around for about 10, 15 minutes, come back in with my black bag and say, okay, I got all the FBI agents in here. It's all taken care of now. And she's like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And she was good for about a month. Uh, all right. Oh, that just... is part of the job right. as a cop. That's part of the job as a warrior. That is part of the job in the aspect of assuring other people that things are okay, mm -hmm. that the world around them is perfectly, it's, it's fine. And to right. play act when it is called upon. Yeah. Yes. And the, what I'm, what I'm the, there's a ritual aspect. There's a theater aspect to what mm -hmm. you're doing as well. All right. And that's part of that aspect of the divine and masculine, in my personal opinion as well. All right. That you have to take that position, not just mm -hmm. as the warrior as per se. All right. But you have to embody it for, embody it for the, the culture as a whole around you. Right. That's a beautiful insight. You have to be assure them that you have things at least under control. And some people have an issue, in my personal opinion, with the lack of emotion or whatever else that comes with that job. Um, but I also will assure you that the emotion has to be controlled, at least in the aspect that you're showing the proper face for the people that you're dealing with. All right. And that I think is what I think a lot of people have seem to have an issue with. That's mm -hmm. my personal. Yeah. But anyway, thank you. let me, so let me That's talk. Beautiful. Uh, thank Cameron, you. You've touched on something very, very meaningful. I, I really, yeah, fact, that's like very insightful. Continue that discussion at some point, even more in more detail. Yeah. The name of the author was Kenny last name. Uh, Put it in the chat. Okay. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, I will find a link and I'll drop it in the chat. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that good. sounds great. We are uh, running out of time for this segment. So wow. I just want to conclude by conclusion. saying that um, one of my favorite um, theater directors is Julie Taymor. And not only does she do such beautiful work, especially depicting animal spirits, but she tells this story of being in Indonesia early on and she happens upon a clearing out exploring by the full light of the moon and she sees this pageantry going on elaborate costumes and a gathering of people and this beautiful choreography going on and she looks around and she says where's the audience and then it dawns on her the gods are the audience and that this whole pageantry was a uh, for the gods that they were doing this by the light of the moon for the gods and i thought that was so beautiful that so much of what we do is for the gods and even with costume uh we met this bear shamaness she was a lawyer by day and a bear shaman by but i would say by night because that's more akin to that alternate reality and we went to go visit her on a sunday and when we pulled up to her house, she was out there in her garden and she was in the full, beautiful skirt. She was bedecked with all this Navajo jewelry and the earrings and the pendants. And I walked up to her and I said, Misha, thank you for inviting us. And you look so resplendent. And here you are working in your garden. And she laughed and she said, yes, for us, we always want to show up in beauty, walk in beauty because we are reflecting the beauty of nature back to our creator. So whether I'm in my garden or I'm in full ceremony, no matter what I'm doing, I try to walk in beauty because it is a signal back to the creator that I see nature's beauty, that I am showing up to reflect that back to the creator. And I thought, wow, how beautiful. It makes me understand more this, this 
urge that we have to bedeck ourselves, to show up. As my father would say, show up and be your best. And this was one way that Indigenous peoples do this mm -hmm. with all of their beautiful costume and, and stuff. I understood it in a non-commercial, nar narcissistic form. I began to understand it in a higher element. And I want to say also that Mel O'Callaghan, uh, an artist, modern artist, invited right. us to Paris right. uh, in 2017 to help her put on an exhibit showcasing Goodman's work with Ritual. And we were very delighted to take our work and then put it into the format of an art exhibit and performance piece. And we should do a, a slideshow on that and sure. a little talk. Mm -hmm. But that this that ritual, we took our ritual and put it on a modern art stage. And it was, it was so much really fun. beautiful. Was I don't have time to go into that. Right. I want to end by saying that, uh, Ellie, there's much more to talk about with you and with the Van Pools and with anybody who would like to share and look at gender issues, mm. because we are um, now at an age where we are really trying to explore what is biological gender, what is cultural gender, what are the Genetics. roles of gender, what are the restrictions of gender, how do we heal all of those issues through the ages. And so I'd like to invite you and the Van Pools and anyone else who wants to join in in a panel discussion, okay. because this is a current um, discussion that our age needs to have to do some healing around this. Mm. Um, twin souls, twin spirits, um, male, female, uh, the union of male, female in mm. various guises and ways, part of the healing that needs to go on at a future time. So, uh, Ellie, thank you so much for, for bringing Shakespeare to the to the fore. And there's so much more to explore with this. And your performance was beautiful and heartfelt. And we brought up some very good issues on Valentine's Day so that we can get back to right balance, right balance between within ourselves, between us and our partner, our community, our world, between this realm and that realm, um, between us and the universe at large. Yeah. I want to say that as we move into a sacred dance piece, that there's a, a beautiful Please, quote. Uh, you can say it as soon as I get to say okay, it. Um, I want to, this is a quote from Samuel Johnson from 1794. He says, by day, the frolic and the, net, the dance by night. The dance by night. We're about to move into a sacred dance. And I think <laughs> the night here is a metaphor for that other realm. Mm. We are here in our ordinary waking reality, but we also want to step into that dream state, the night. So I'll and throw that over to you. Well, first of all, Ellie, um, the, the situation, you know, we're in the world, the planet, it seems more complicated than ever as humanity's challenges and having youthful, intelligent, insightful uh, people like yourself is where we have to depend on. We have to see people like yourself who want to bring forth that, that ability for us to transcend the the evening news and the things around us and our internet connections and all these things and to say what it is to be human and how we can maintain that humanness as we go forward with the complications of the future so i'm just so uh, happy to know you and, and inspired and i hope there's thousands of you out there that are, <laughs> there and, are they're millions <laughs> millions of you yeah, exactly that will, yeah. that will make this transition for us so and thank Love. you for finding the connection with our work here and also bringing that forward in new ways. Thank Stay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ellie. Thank you.
Thank yeah. you for protecting us yeah. in our space. Yeah. 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 Thank you to all the warriors out there. Thank yeah. you for protecting us yeah. in our space. Yeah. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you for the Bye -bye. divine. Ten nine eight seven six five four three two. <laughs>